If you're new to our study in the book of Romans, in the first two and a half chapters of this book, Paul makes the argument that we are all accountable to God and that we cannot deny that God exists because God has revealed himself to all of humanity through what we're calling the three C's, through creation, through conscience, and through commandments. That's been our Bible study for the last couple of weeks. And so God has revealed himself in this way so that man cannot deny that he exists. But that also means that man is accountable to God. And in the first two and a half chapters here in Romans, Paul gives us the bad news. The bad news is that we've all disobeyed God. We are all sinners. And the human race is guilty before God. Despite the world's narrative, which basically says that man is basically good, God's narrative, the Bible says that man is basically bad and in need of a savior. Otherwise, we will die in our sins and incur the wrath of God. And so that's all the bad news in the first two and a half chapters. And as I've been saying over the past couple of weeks, we have to hear the bad news in order to really appreciate the good news and to see our need for the good news. And so for those of you who have been with us the past couple of weeks in the first two and a half chapters of Romans, you've made it through the bad news. Congratulations. Thank you for sticking around because now the letter shifts here in chapter three. There's a transition in verse 21. So if you have your Bibles open to chapter three, verse 21, you can circle or you can highlight in your Bibles the first two words of verse 21, but now. So that, that's his transition. Everything else we've read and studied before this point is the bad news, but now, he's going to get into the good news, but now, verse 21, the righteousness of God apart from the law is revealed, being witnessed by the law and the prophets, even the righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ to all and on all who believe, for there is no difference. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Everybody. Verse 24, being justified freely by his grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, whom God set forth as a propitiation by his blood through faith to demonstrate his righteousness because in his forbearance, God had passed over the sins that were previously committed to demonstrate at the present time his righteousness that he might be just and the justifier of the one who has faith in Jesus. Where is boasting then? It is excluded, like like nobody can boast about ourselves. By, By what law of works? No, but by the law of faith. Therefore, we conclude that a man is justified by faith apart from the deeds of the law. Or is he the God of the Jews only? Is he not also the God of the Gentiles? Yes, of the Gentiles also, since there is one God who will justify the circumcised by faith and the uncircumcised through faith. Do we then make void the law through faith? Certainly not. On the contrary, we establish the law. Go into chapter 4 with me, verse 1. What then shall we say that Abraham our father has found according to the flesh? For if Abraham was justified by works, he has something to boast about, but not before God. For what does the scripture say? Abraham believed God and it was accounted to him or credited to him for righteousness. Now to him who works, the wages are not counted as grace, but as debt. But to him who does not work, but believes on him who justifies the ungodly, his faith is accounted for righteousness. Just as David also describes the blessedness of the man to whom God imputes righteousness apart from works. Blessed are those whose lawless deeds are forgiven and whose sins are covered. Blessed is the man to whom the Lord shall not impute sin. Father, we thank you for this time in your word. And as we open up our Bibles here, we pray we would also open up our hearts to receive what you would have to say to us today. Thank you for the good news of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And you loved us so much, you came to rescue us, redeem us and save us from our own sins and from the sinful world. And so we give you praise and glory and honor. We ask the Lord now to minister to our hearts as we study together. We love you in Jesus' name. And everybody said, amen. Well, 
you've probably noticed one of the challenges to reading and understanding the book of Romans is that it is deeply theological and at times it, it somewhat reads like a law book. Uh, Paul makes these logical arguments and he uses uh, a lot of times even like five syllable words to communicate his legal argument, five syllable words like justification, propitiation. Uh, but there are also a few monosyllabic words that are important too, like faith and grace. And so in order for us to really appreciate the message, we have to define a few words. And so I'm going to define those words. Now, in the first chapter of Romans, we already defined faith and grace. So this will be a repeat for those two words. And then we'll look at justification and propitiation. But faith is basically belief, trust, and reliance on God, who he is and what he promises, specifically in Christ alone for salvation. Grace can be defined as God's undeserved favor toward unworthy people, that's us. And justification is basically a formal acquittal by God, whereby he pronounces a sinner to be righteous because of that sinner's faith in Christ. And then propitiation, the New Living Translation uses the phrase, the sacrifice for sin. So that kind of gives a, a broad view of what it is, but it literally means the sacrificial act by which the wrath of God was appeased and we were reconciled to him. And of course that was accomplished through, through Jesus. Now, assuming that nobody here or watching online actually wants to go to hell and suffer for your sins, assuming that, since, not if, since the human race is guilty before God, and since because of our guilt as sinners before God, we all deserve his wrath, the question becomes, what is it, how can we be made right with God to escape his wrath? That's an important question, because this is what Paul is telling us here. He says, listen, I want you to understand that we're all subject to wrath. We're all guilty before God. We can't deny that God exists. He's revealed himself in creation, conscience, and commandments. We're all accountable to him, but because we're sinners, we deserve his wrath. So how can we be made right with him and escape his wrath? That's the big question. And he's going to answer this throughout the whole book of Romans, but in particular today, we're going to look at now starting the good news. And Paul makes three points here in this passage about how to get in right standing with God, or in other words, how to be saved, what our salvation. And he's going to make three particular points that it is not gained through law, it is not limited to Jews, and it is not earned through works. So if you have your Bibles there, look back at chapter 3 where we started, verse 21, where Paul talks about the righteousness of God. And, and he's going to talk about the righteousness of God because the argument he makes is that we don't have any righteousness in and of ourselves, and so we need God's righteousness. But how do we attain, or better worded, how do we receive God's righteousness? Because God's righteousness is not a thing, God's righteousness is a person, and that person is Jesus Christ. He is the personification of righteousness. So when we receive and believe on Jesus, we receive God's righteousness. And so Paul argues here in verse 21, he's making kind of this legal defense of, of his position about how we're saved. And in verse 21, he says, the righteousness of God is, notice the phrase, apart from the law, apart from the law. Now, when he says law, he's referring to the law of God. He's referring to the commandments. He's not talking about, you know, our modern legal system. He says, look, the righteousness of God is apart from his own commandments. Now, how can his righteousness be apart from commandments? Well, in this sense that we don't receive the righteousness of God by obeying his commandments. The righteousness of God is not received through the law. However, the righteousness of God is revealed through the law and the prophets. That's the rest of verse 21, where Paul says, but now the righteousness of God apart from the law is revealed, being witnessed by the law and the prophets. Now, what does that phrase mean? Well, the law and the prophets is a broad term that basically means the, the entirety of the Hebrew scriptures that we would call our Old Testament. From Genesis to Malachi, the law and the prophets reveal, testify, witness to Jesus. 
So that all through the Old Testament, Jesus is revealed so that we can understand the righteousness of God. Look, you know, modern pastors who talk about how we don't need the Old Testament, they they are so wrong in saying that because the Old Testament reveals Christ, the New Testament fulfills Christ. And so we need to understand the Old and the New Testament, it goes together. Because listen, Christ is seen throughout the entirety of the Old Testament. And even in each book of the Old Testament, Jesus is revealed in some kind of a type. Now, the the word type, when we say type in biblical terms, that means some way that Jesus is presented or he is revealed. uh, some, Some person, some event, or some element of every Old Testament book paints a picture of Christ. And I'm going to rattle this off, and some of you have heard this before, but uh, when you look at each book of the Old Testament, you can see Christ revealed. Example, in Genesis, Jesus Christ is the seed of the woman. In Exodus, he is the Passover lamb. In Leviticus, he is our high priest. In Numbers, he is the cloud by day and the fire by night. In Deuteronomy, he is the prophet like Moses. In Joshua, he is the commander of the Lord's army. In Judges, he is our judge and lawgiver. In Ruth, he is our kinsman redeemer. In 1st and 2nd Samuel, he is the prophet of the Lord. In 1st and 2nd Kings, he is the reigning king. In 1st and 2nd Chronicles, he is the glorious temple. In Ezra, he is our faithful scribe. In Nehemiah, he is the rebuilder of everything broken. In Esther, he is our Mordecai, our advocate. In Job, he is our ever-living redeemer. In Psalms, he is our shepherd. In Proverbs, he is our wisdom. In Ecclesiastes, he is our meaning of life. In the Song of Solomon, he is the loving bridegroom. In Isaiah, he is the prince of peace. In Jeremiah, he is the righteous branch. In Lamentations, he is the weeping prophet. In Ezekiel, he is the son of man. In Daniel, he is the fourth man in the fiery furnace. In Hosea, he is the faithful husband. In Joel, he is the outpourer of the Holy Spirit. In Amos, he is our burden bearer. In Obadiah, he is our mighty savior. In Jonah, he is the great evangelist. In Micah, he is the everlasting ruler born in Bethlehem. In Nahum, he is the avenger of God's elect. In Habakkuk, he is the watchman. In Zephaniah, he is the restorer of the remnant. In Haggai, he is the cleansing fountain. In Zechariah, he is the one pure pierced for us. And in Malachi, he is the son of righteousness with healing in his wings. He is Jesus. He is Jesus. And so he's revealed throughout the Old Testament and into the new, obviously. And so we need Jesus and Jesus doesn't get into us to make us righteous by our obeying the law. He's not gained through the law. So on these three points, On the screen, there's a secondary point to each one. He's not Jesus and salvation through Jesus and right standing with God through Jesus is not gained through the law. It's through faith. It's through faith. Look back here at chapter 3, verse 22, first part of verse 22, where he says, even the righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ to all and on all who believe. Notice that, righteousness of God, faith, faith in what? Not a what, a whom, person, Jesus, to all and on all who believe. So faith and belief go together. In other words, I don't gain righteousness by how I behave, but in the one I believe. It's not behavior, it's belief. So behavior, obeying the rules and the commandments of God, honors God in the sense that we're carrying out Uh, his good standard, but by obeying the law itself does not make us righteous because it's not how I behave. It's the one in whom I believe and it's Jesus. So that takes faith. We have to exercise faith in believing what Jesus Christ did for us. And so Paul will make the argument from chapter four when he talks here about believing faith and that that's what makes us righteous. And he talks about Abraham. And, and, and Paul talks about Abraham. Now, Abraham was the father of, of the Jewish people. Uh, Abraham was just a regular guy living in a town called Ur in the Chaldean region, which is in modern Iraq. God taps that guy in the shoulder, says, I'm going to make you into a great nation. Uh, all people will be blessed through your seed, through Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, would eventually come the Messiah, Jesus. 
And so out of Abraham's seed comes eventually a savior for the whole world. And Paul makes the argument, especially to the Jews who thought that righteousness came by obeying the letter of the law, Paul goes, what about Abraham? Because Abraham was 400 years before the law was given. 400 years before God gave the law through Moses, Abraham lived. And yet, in chapter 4, verse 3, Paul quotes from Genesis where he says, For what does the Scripture say? Abraham believed God, and it was accounted to him or credited to him for righteousness. He says, so was he, he says, was Abraham righteous or not? Yes, Abraham was righteous. How did he get righteous? It wasn't by obeying the law, because there was no law. He got righteous because he believed God, and by faith it was credited to him righteousness. And so again, our definition for faith is belief, trust, and reliance on God who he is and what he promises, specifically in Christ alone for salvation. Now, obviously, Abraham was before Christ, but the idea is that he was seen in God's eyes as righteous, not by what he did, but in whom he believed. It was his faith in God and obedience to God that God saw him as righteous. And so it is true for us today. We're not made righteous by obeying the law. We're made righteous through faith in Jesus Christ. And this is how faith works. Because if you're new to Christianity or to church in general, you're like, okay, faith, faith, faith. Well, you know, faith in Jesus, what exactly does that mean? So let me try to summarize it. Again, we're all guilty before God because we're all sinners. No one can claim to be innocent. We're all sinners. You know, the world usually admits at least, well, I'm not perfect. Okay, good enough. You're saying you're a sinner. Um, and because we're all sinners, we are condemned to die and to be punished. And why is that? Is it like God is, you know, a killjoy just out to, you know, uh, swat everybody for their sinfulness? No, it's because of the character of God. Listen, he is a holy and a just God and his justice demands, his justice demands that he punish unrighteousness. Again, you know, think about a secular judge in a courthouse. If someone was guilty before that judge and the judge just went, oh, well, we don't really care, you can go free, everybody would be outraged because that's not a just judge. And so God, if he just overlooked our sin and said, well, everybody gets a free pass, everybody gets to go to heaven, no big deal, he would not be just and holy. So his holiness demands justice. But listen, the Bible says, but he doesn't want anyone to perish. He wants none to perish, but all to come to repentance. God's heart is to rescue us from our broken condition. He wants to save us from our sins. He wants none to perish, but all to come to repentance. And why? Because he loves us. It's John 3, 16. For God so loved the world. You and I didn't do anything to deserve his love. But in his loving character, he loves us that he wants to rescue us so that no one has to endure the punishment that we rightfully deserve. Now, here's the plan that God implemented. He's like, if I, if I just had one person, if I had one righteous person without sin, who could, if using modern terminology, who could kind of take one for the team, for all the other unrighteous people in the world, I will put their guilt on the one innocent person, and I'll accept that innocent person, my wrath will be satisfied in that one person who will die on behalf of all the unrighteous people. But here's what happened. The Bible says that God surveyed the landscape of humanity and he found none righteous. Nobody was good enough. There was nobody good enough to take one for the team. And so in Isaiah chapter 63, verse five, God says, I looked, I looked and there was no one to help. And I wondered that there was no one to uphold. Therefore, my own arm worked salvation. What does he mean? When I saw that no one was righteous in humanity to take one for the team, I decided to do it myself. My own arm worked salvation. And in this wonderful, miraculous moment, divinity met humanity in the womb of a young virgin named Mary and God stepped into our world. God took on flesh. He said, I then will stand in the gap for sinful humanity and I will take the punishment intended for them in the person of Jesus Christ. 
So Jesus comes, dies on a cross for our sins, sheds his blood to make atonement for us. By his sacrifice, God deliberately, intentionally said, because of what Christ has done, I will put all of the guilt, the shame, the punishment, my wrath will be appeased against all humanity on my son Jesus. This is 2 Corinthians 5, 21, where Paul would write, for he made him, God made Jesus, who knew no sin, to be sin for us that we might become the righteousness of God in Christ. And this is the literal definition of propitiation. Jesus dies for the sins of the world. His sacrifice appeased the wrath of God. And then God says to all the unrighteous people, you and me, he says, now listen, if you just will simply believe by faith what my son has done, my plan of redemption for all humanity, you can be saved. You can be in right standing with me. You can be forgiven. That's how you are made righteous. Not by obeying all the rules. That's noble, but that doesn't change the heart. What changes the heart is faith in what Jesus did for us on that cross. And so exercise faith, believe. We weren't there. You and I weren't there to see Jesus hanging on a cross. Even the ones who were there, sadly, many did not put their faith in him. He came among his own and his own received him not, the Bible says. So this takes faith to believe that what God did through Jesus Christ is sufficient for you and me to have our sins forgiven and to be right with God. And by the way, this is for all who would believe. And this is the second point, because the second point is it's not limited to the Jews. It's not limited to the Jews. Uh, look at verse 22 there, chapter three, verse 22, the second part of verse 22, to all and on all who believe. For there is no difference. By that, what Paul means here is no difference between Jew and Gentile. It's for all, on all, who believe, who have faith. Why? Because of the next verse, 23, because all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. None of us measures up to the perfect standard of God. So we have to exercise faith. We have to believe in what Christ did for us on the cross. But he wants to make the point it's not limited to the Jews. Yes, the Jews played a special role in God's providential plan to rescue the world. He raised up a people group through whom the Messiah would come. But that Messiah was not just for the Jewish people. Jesus came for all people. He came for all people. And so that's the second part of point number two. Not limited to the Jews it's for all. Salvation is for all people. Right standing with God is for all who believe. Look again in your Bibles, chapter 3, verses 29 and 30. Paul asks, or is he the God of the Jews only? He says, is he not also the God of the Gentiles? Yes, of the Gentiles also, since there is one God who will justify the circumcised by faith and the uncircumcised through faith. Now, circumcision was a covenant sign that the Jewish people belong to God. And, um, you know, today um, men practice circumcision for a variety of reasons. But in this particular day, look, as Paul is writing here, no one else was circumcised in the known world except the Jews because it was a covenant sign. And he's just simply saying the circumcised are the Jews, the uncircumcised are the Gentiles. He said, this truth is for all who believe, whether you're Jewish or whether you're Gentile. It's for everybody. And, and again, as we said last week, Gentile means anyone who's non-Jewish. So we're just talking about the rest of the world. Jews and Gentiles alike, every person on the face of the earth can be made right with God through faith in Jesus Christ. Whether they are Jewish, whether they are Muslim, whether they are Buddhist, whether they are Baha'i, whatever your upbringing Everyone needs to turn to Jesus because there's only one name given under heaven by which we must be saved, and his name is Jesus. His name is Jesus. Finally, number three, it's not earned through works. Salvation is not owned, uh, earned through works. It's not what we do. It's by grace. It's by grace. Look again here in your Bibles at chapter four. I'll read the first five verses again. For what then shall we say, that Abraham our father is found according to the flesh? Like, like did, did, was he righteous by his own doings? Verse 2, for if Abraham was justified by works, he has something to boast about. 
He, said, he adds, but not before God. Like, no, he, he can't boast before God because he didn't do anything. Abraham didn't do anything. Verse 3, for what does the scripture say? Abraham believed God and it was accounted to him for righteousness. Now to him who works, the wages are not counted as grace, but as debt. I'll explain that in a minute. But to him who does not work, but believes on him who justifies the ungodly, his faith is accounted for righteousness. So three times in that passage I just read, the word work is mentioned, works or work. And he's making the case that you can't work your way to heaven. It's not by all the things, all the nice, wonderful things that you do. God's not impressed because nobody's going to be able to stand before God and boast you know, and say, well, God, you know, the reason I'm here in heaven is because all these wonderful things I've done. I gave to charity. I came to church regularly and, you know, all these great things. Like God's not impressed. There's nothing we can boast that we have done. And in particular, verse 4, when he talks about now to him who works, the wages are not counted as grace, but as debt. What he means is this. When you and I go to a job, when you work your job, you get paid. And you get paid because you've earned it. You've worked hard, and thus you've earned it. And Paul's saying, it's not like that with God. It's not like God, you know, you deserve something because you've earned something. He says, no boss gives you pay out of just the graciousness of his or her heart. You get paid because you've worked hard and you've earned it. He says, so please understand, that's not the way heaven works. Because God doesn't owe us a thing. He's not obligated to us in any way. Why? Because we don't deserve anything. You can't work your way to heaven. Listen, friends, it is faith alone in Christ alone. And Paul's addressing this false notion that a lot of people still think today that I can win God's favor by doing a lot of good things. He'll, he'll be impressed. He'll be happy with me. I'll, 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 I'll you know, make him proud. Either that or people think, if I do enough good things, I will compensate for all the bad things I've done. That'll balance the scales, and then I'll be good to go. And Paul's writing here to address all this. He, he, he says, listen, it's not by works. It's by grace, because grace means that this is God's undeserved favor towards unworthy people. We don't, we don't deserve this. It's undeserved. We are unworthy. And yet God lavishes on us the righteousness that comes through faith in his son Jesus. So it's, it's not by works. Listen, it is, it is in Christ alone. Faith alone in Christ alone. Now I'm emphasizing that because uh, a couple of weeks ago when we started into the book of Romans, I made a statement, and I wasn't being funny, I was being very sincere, that I, I really hoped and prayed that especially all of us would, would be set free from some work-oriented, impress God, you know, kind of, a, of, a, of an approach, but particularly for those of you with Roman Catholic backgrounds. And I made the statement in the first week about how, in particular, I'm praying that Roman Catholics will understand God's grace in a fresh way because the Roman Catholic Church basically teaches it's Jesus plus works. Now, when I said that a few weeks ago, I got some emails, and, um, <laughs> and, I, and I had a gentleman, and it, very nicely, but, but emailed me and basically said, you got your facts wrong. The Catholic, he was Catholic, and he said the Catholic Church does not believe in Jesus plus works. And, and yet, l let, me, let me just say that if you think that, you don't know your own Catholic doctrine because it is taught, in fact, it's in writing. Listen, Martin Luther was a Catholic monk, and when he read the book of Romans, it gave him such new insight into his relationship with Christ that it was by grace through faith that he realized all the works-oriented approach to God that the Roman Catholic Church had been teaching him was not in step with Scripture. That's why he left the Roman Catholic Church, 1517, the Protestant Reformation. It was based on this book. And in response to, a few years later, in response to the Protestant Reformation and Luther's movement, the Roman Catholic Church in the Council of Trent in the, in the mid-1500s, wrote a document. And the Roman Catholic Church today still abides by the Council of Trent. And I'm going to quote to you Canon 9 from the Council of Trent. Listen, quote, if anyone says that the sinner is justified by faith alone, 
meaning that nothing else is required to cooperate in order to obtain the grace of justification, let him be anathema. Let him be accursed. It's in their printed doctrine. So with all due respect, and not just to Roman Catholics, this is true for anyone who adds anything to faith alone in Christ alone. You add faith plus baptism, you add faith plus penance, faith plus indulgence, faith plus speaking in tongues, you've nullified the gospel. It is faith alone in Christ alone that saves us. And sincerely, not to pick on the Roman Catholic Church, but just one more point, because it's of great concern what is happening. If you noticed or have read, just recently, December the 18th, 2023, Pope Francis issued a papal proclamation that Roman Catholic priests are now free to bless same-sex marriages. Every Roman Catholic watching or here today, you ought to be fleeing the Catholic Church after that. You ought to be fleeing the Catholic Church, and maybe in, um, in, as a goodwill gesture, we ought to take up a collection and buy a Bible and send it to the Pope, because he's not reading it. He's not reading it. So, listen, we can't add anything to faith. It's faith alone in Christ alone. Why? Because it's not of our works. It is by grace. Look again at your Bibles, and then we'll close with communion. Chapter 3, verse 24. Chapter 3, verse 24, being justified freely by His, what? Grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. You see, salvation is a gift. It's an undeserved gift that we can't earn, but we receive by faith. That's Ephesians 2, 8 and 9, for by grace you have been saved through faith, and this not of yourselves, not of works, it's the gift of God lest no one should boast. And so receive that gift. If you don't know Jesus as your Savior, just open your hearts, receive what He did, believe by faith. What He did on the cross was sufficient for you and me. And then you shall be saved. You say, is there any catch to this? No, you don't have to overcomplicate it. What Christ did for us is available to all who would believe by faith and receive Him as Lord and Savior. I'm gonna give you that opportunity when we receive communion but let's first pause and pray, ushers, you can come. Father in heaven, we thank you for your word, the liberating good news of the gospel of Jesus Christ, that we are all sinners, and Christ is a great savior who died for our sins and took on the punishment intended for us to appease the wrath of God, so that through faith in what Jesus did, we can be forgiven and free. Lord, I pray that people would come to accept and to know you in that way. Those who have never opened their hearts to you, I pray today would be the day that they would trust you. We thank you for the elements we're about to receive, the, the, the cup, the juice, a reminder of your blood, the bread, a reminder of your body that was broken for us on a cross. And we're grateful, Lord, that you loved us so much. You would come into our world to rescue us. And so we worship you with thanksgiving. In Jesus' name, amen.